back in uh, what is it October 19 of 2015, I did this article. This is five years ago almost now, four and a half years. Uh, yo, it ain't us. Why PMPs? That's uh, pest management professionals are taking the rap for stuff that we're not even doing. And I cite, not only do I cite, I have link after link after link in here on this podcast of all the data of who is actually using the pesticides, who is actually applying, who is putting all those millions and billions of pounds in the ground, contaminating the environment, and it ain't us. It's never been us. We're such, we're like less than 1% of all the pesticide that's applied in this country and in the world. Professional pest control operators apply less than 1% of the chemical. And that even includes if you throw in wildlife, if you throw in lawn care, which is a totally separate industry from pest management, with weed control and fungus disease and lawn care and all the things and all the bans that are going on around the world, we are not even close to applying 1%. When you look at the raw numbers, when you look at the facts, we are true environmentalists and stewards, us that are professionals. I can't talk about the unscrupulous guy, but I'm talking about as a professional pest control guy, we apply less pesticide as an entire industry than homeowners do buying over the counter the same chemical out of the same dilution. Here is the problem. Here's what people think. Because it is sold over the counter, it's diluted so much that it isn't effective. That is not true. Most of the time, when we read a pesticide label and we dilute it, we're diluting it to the same volume that you as a home or pest or, or, or a homeowner are buying the ready-to-use, what is known as an RTU, a ready-to-use product, that all you have to do is apply it. And that's what we do. We're obligated to dilute that to whatever that label says to dilute it to. And what's happened is that there's a DIY craze going on now where professional products are available to homeowners. And, and over-the-counter products have been available to homeowners for a hundred years. This is nothing new. This is nothing to be armed, up in arms about. The problem that the industry is having is that us as pest control professional, we are licensed, we are trained, we have to pay insurances, we have 57 items on our, on our, on our P&L that we have to cover as a business, and the laws are different for professional pest control operators, even if we apply the same chemical, the law is different than to a homeowner who's applying it to his own property. And the fact is that if we apply it incorrectly, we're held liable. If a homeowner applies it incorrectly, he can poison his family, but he's not going to go to jail or get fined for it. And that is the problem that sometimes they're getting a hold of, especially rodenticides, that are, that are anticoagulant first and second generation rodenticide and using it inappropriately, and then kids are getting poisoned, animals are getting poisoned, and nobody's held responsible for it because it's a homeowner doing it to his own property. If we do it, we end up going to jail. Our company gets closed down because we're supposed to know, but the problem is that's the law, and most people are not familiar with pest control law. They're not familiar with FIFRA, even though it's on every label of every pesticide that they buy over the counter, that RAID spray that you buy, it has a legal requirement on it, same as ours, and I'm going to show it to you. And so what we have to do is we have to, we're at an age where we're going to have to educate people on the proper use, us as an industry have to take the lead and have to take the role of what the universities are not doing. The universities are writing great material and great content that nobody reads because it is written in such a way that it's written for a guy with a PhD. The average person looking for a pesticide 
and is looking for a product is not going to sit and read a PhD dissertation on the on the uses of pyrethroids. This is the stuff we're trained on. Yet 80% of the pesticides applied in the country to residential properties are applied by homeowners. They're not applied by a professional. The same dilution, the same chemicals, the same availability, yet only 20% of people in America buy professional pest control services simply because it's expensive and only the top 10% of Americas pay for it because let's look at the facts. A lawyer that makes $250 an hour isn't going to sit there and do his own pest control. It's much cheaper for him to hire us to do it. Doctors, lawyers, engineers, people who don't want to handle this and don't want to do it and, and it's something they don't want to handle. It's not because pest control is so difficult to do. It is because simply they don't want to do it. And we do have the training. We do have the equipment. We do have the 10,000 hours of experience for those of us who are experienced to do this. And we can tackle a problem very quickly and very efficiently while you can spend the next six months tackling it. And so the associations aren't doing it. The universities aren't doing it. The government really isn't doing it because nobody wants to hear, hey, you can't do that. Nobody's going to listen to that. So if we're going to reach people and educate them, whether they want to do it themselves or they want to hire us because they're, it's an, their economic capability to hire a professional, they should at least have the facts and have the education. And this is where we're at in our industry where we see so many things that break our heart. As pest control professionals that irritate us, that bother us, that say, how is it that these people are putting their own family at risk by doing this? And they think it's because of the ignorance, because they don't understand that that pesticide is being applied at a rate, same as ours, that it is the same active ingredient. It's just in a ready to use form. And this is why the rodenticides got taken off the market. And now you're sold these little boxes with pesticide for killing rodents because you're not allowed to buy the packs anymore because of the inherent danger of putting out loose rodenticide. So we have to educate. And, and, and I sit around at extension service meetings and I'll sit at, you know, pest management meetings and I'll sit in groups and in think tanks and even in my own group and in other groups. And I have this discussion and everybody agrees that people need to be educated. The problem is nobody will agree on who's going to do it. So I, your fearless pest leader, is going to take on this challenge because somebody's got to do it. It gets to the point we got to stop talking about it. 50 years of talking about integrated pest management between the government and universities where it's taught in every university, yet not even, not, most pest control professionals don't really even understand what integrated pest management is. So let's look at some facts. Let's look at some things that are, are true and let's understand them. Here, when you have, you know, defining of, of, of pest control people or anybody that is fined or arrested or a pesticide where they find, you know, 20 bald eagles died and 10 foxes died and a mountain lion died, it's usually because. 99.9% .9 of the time is because somebody applied an illegal pesticide in an illegal way that it was not the intended use of that product. It's like you're blaming Tide for kids eating Tide Pods. This is what it amounts to. So what happens is that pesticides are just as toxic as detergents or detergents are just as toxic as pesticide. Here is my attitude towards chemicals. All chemicals are bad. All of them. All medication is bad. None of it is good for us. It is a necessary part of us living in a society where we have to. I am a cancer survivor. I took chemotherapy. I know what chemotherapy does to your body. Even though they saved me. I don't live a full life as a normal person because I got chemotherapy. At 10 years old, it saved my life. But there are consequences. 
There's consequences that I take lipids uh, to, uh, to control my lipids. I have to take medication to control my lipids. I have to take medication to control my high blood pressure at a very young age because those are the side effects later on. The fact that I have muscle atrophy and certain muscles in my body are, are damaged because of the chemotherapy. You see, so I have a respect for chemical unlike other people that I treat every chemical as if it was dangerous, even if it's shown not to be. I don't have them near children. Look at, look at this, and I don't know if you can see it. I'm going to try to blow this up for you. But it says that a man, uh, let me hear, where did this thing go? Okay, and, and you can see this. A man, a uh, Windsor man fine in pesticide case. Notice it says a pesticide case. It doesn't say that this man is not a professional pest control person. He's not a person that read a label. He's a person that David Barnes uh, 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 of Bednar's Farms was lace, had laced hot dogs with Furidan in an effort to kill raccoons. No, the article should have said that a, a farmer illegally applied a pesticide. But see, that, that doesn't make the news. That doesn't make the headline. He took a chemical that which was not an intended use and he laced the hot dog with this chemical and then threw it out to control raccoons in his farm that were destroying his crops. This is the equivalent of somebody taking a hot dog because they don't have a rodenticide. They don't want to buy a rodenticide. They don't want to spend the money on rodenticide cases to safely apply a rodenticide, take a hot dog, and dip it into, I don't know, radiator fluid, and then throw it out and killing animals with it without any understanding of the consequences and not caring about the consequences of what happened. If you take away first generation and second generation anticoagulant rodenticides from people, people will get desperate and they will do stupid things like this. There is no need for this to be done because there are products available that you can legally get. And if you put them in the right station and if you follow the label and you follow the law, you get control. The thing is, you're not supposed to kill raccoons with poisons out in the field. You're supposed to trap them. And there are laws in your state of how you're supposed to. But I don't want to go through that. I want the cheap and quick, dirty method. And this is what happened in this case. So now you go over to this case over here. And, and this is, you know, a man indicted, okay, in pesticide poisoning of a Delaware family on vacation in St. John. Well, what, what you have to understand is that they used an illegal pesticide that was not supposed to be used, that was banned in that country, in the United States for use, and they used an illegal pesticide because it was cheaper to get. We find that the parent company, that the manager is sentenced to 12 months in prison. This is not what professional pest control people do using illegal pesticides that are banned in an illegal way in a, in a non-judicious way to control pests the problem is here's what we see in, in the industry as professionals we see homeowners people doing stuff like this all the time taking rodenticides and just throwing it out in the yard where a dog or a child or anybody can pick it up because they don't want to put it in a box they haven't read the label they haven't read that you're not supposed to do that. That, the, that when a child, you know, that the, the cases that are reported about rodenticide poisoning always involves usually a child under six because of the improper use of it. If that would be in a case in the ground where it's either put with a wire in the ground where a child can't lift it, can't move it, or it's in a, in a case that has a 10 to 12 pound weight that a five or six year old child can't just easily toss it around, these things wouldn't be happening. 
But the reality is that most of the cases reported of rodenticide poisoning aren't reported by an illegal use or an improper application by a pest control. It is by the homeowner himself poisoning his own family. This is the fact. This is the reality. And this is why I am taking the time and I'm taking the effort to educate the public on the proper use of pesticides, the same training that I would get as a pest control professional, I'm taking the time to give it to you for free so that you can be educated, so that you can do the right thing, you can get the results you want. And if this turns out to be too much, don't do the wrong thing. Don't do the illegal thing, okay? Hire a professional then to do it because you can't handle it because it is a lot of work. It is a lot of knowledge that it is so simple just to take a product and put it out. Anybody can do that. And most people think that that's what we do as pest control professional. So that isn't it. So, okay, so now here's the problem that you have. Nobody really knows what pesticide, what's being done with it, how much is accumulating, what's happening. So they decided to do a study on the use of point of sale data tracking use patterns of residential pesticide methodology development. Basically, we decided to track how pesticides were used and stored from the point of purchase. And, and here's what it says. Look at the background. Residential pesticides have been shown to be a major source of pesticide exposure to people in the United States. However, little is understood about the exposure to household pesticides and, and the resilient health effects. One reason that little is known about home use pesticide exposure, I'm sorry, and, and it is the lack of comprehensive data. We know we see it all the time. We see people just spraying, hosing their kitchen down with a can of Raid, thinking that is the right thing to do. You need an actual study to show this because it isn't known. And this is the problem when we run into studies that say people are poisoned. Exposure, understand that exposure to a pesticide, okay, and, and having acute toxicity or chronic toxicity is two different things. Exposure doesn't mean you got intoxicated. You could have an allergic reaction. You could have acute toxicity where you pass out because you applied that in a cabinet while you had your stuck, your head stuck in that cabinet without a respirator and you're spraying this stuff and you inhaled it and all of a sudden you pass out. And then you pass out on the kitchen table, you hit your head and you kill yourself on the way down. This is what can really happen. When aerosol can say, hey, do not apply these in enclosed spaces. People don't read the label. You see, so here 13 bald eagles were found dead in a field. This is what killed them. Again, you look at what the person did. Let me break this a little bigger so that you guys can see it because obviously it's not seeable there. A, a carbophone still occasionally kills birds. They used carbofuron which is banned. It's illegal. If you put this product out and, and animals eat the leaves, they can become poisoned. In November, he was fined $1,000 for killing a bald eagle that fed on calf carcasses that he injected with carbofuron. This is the stuff that goes on that then we're saying, well, you know, pesticides are bad and pesticides are killing people. No, stupid people doing stupid things, irresponsible things, inappropriate things are killing people. Those are the facts. When you take a carcass of an animal injected because you want to kill birds or whatever that are on your field and you do this, you're irresponsible and you're the one giving everybody a black eye. You notice this stuff isn't done by professional pest control people. It killed two red-tailed hawks. 
Wisconsin father and a son were each ordered to pay $100,000 in 2000 after killing more than 70 wild animals, including bald eagles, as they targeted wolves and coyotes with carbure farm. In other words, we don't care what happens to the environment. We don't care what happens to anybody else. We only want to get these coyotes and wolves off our property. The problem is it's expensive to pay a trapper, a professional trapper a person that knows what they're doing with wild animals and deal with this. So we'll just take a shortcut. This is the reality. Let's look at here. So here we have what the CDC says about the injury and surveillance of pesticide poisoning in the United States by workers, by pest control workers. Okay, these are including people who work in pest control. It is between 1.85 and 3.89 per 100,000 employed people. That is the data. People who are in pest control understand how to handle pesticides, understand how to use them, understand how to protect themselves from being exposed to pesticides, and therefore, out of 100,000 workers, three, 1 1.8 to 3, what is it? What's the number? Let me show you down here. Let me, let me bring this up here so that you can see it. I'm pulling up this data. Well, back here. Back. Go. Yep. There's the data at the bottom. This is the other. Acute work-related pesticide poisoning rates, 100,000 employed persons, 16 years over, 2006 study, 1.85 to 3.89. If we are working all the time with pesticides, you would think that there would, the poisonings would be through the roof, that the intoxications would be through the roof. They're not. That's the reality. That's why our insurance rates are so low. You realize that as a pest control professional, the average insurance rate around the company for a small independent guy is somewhere between $1,200 and $2,000 a year. Much higher if you're a landscaper, if you're a roofer, because the, the chances of you getting injured are so high. Not so with pest control. This is the facts. Let's look at another data. This study was performed, and let me bring this up so that you can see it. Okay, this is a study in Minnesota by a regional uh, poison control center in Minnesota. Here is the fact. Nebraska study, I'm going to look at it right here in the center. Let me highlight this for you. Okay, Nebraska study found that an annual incidence rate of pesticide-related incidents, related illnesses, is 1.35 cases per 10,000 population. People are poisoning themselves at a rate of, of what, 10 to 1? Compared to pest control people. Look over here on the left side, right here. Out of 1,420 cases uh, cases files, case files indicating pesticide or primary substance exposure to Minnesota residents, a mean of five years of age, ranging from zero to 85, was identified. 50% of all the cases were below ages three and under, meaning the kids are getting poisoned because adults are leaving pesticides accessible to children when it's right on the label that says, caution, keep out of reach of children. So you got about 700 cases of five and under. Insecticide was identified in the largest percentage of cases. 74% of these cases were insecticides. Followed by herbicides, 12%, rodenticides, 11 and fungicides at 3%. Listen to this. In 85% of these cases, I'm going to put links to all this so you can have it. 85% of all the calls originated from residents. This is the problem that we have. This is why pest control professionals are up in arms. We're being told and we're being lumped together 
with agriculture and with people doing illegal things. And like we are the chemical industry and we're not. As pest control professionals, a great part of our tool that we have is a pesticide. But we also use traps and we also use sealants like foam and caulking and, and door seals when an IPM and we use repair and we use concrete and we use integrated pest management practice and we use stations and traps and glue boards. We don't rely on pesticides alone to do our job. Unlike other industries exclusively have to rely on pesticides. You see, so, so understand that it isn't us doing this. That when the media portrays us as we're evil, we are protecting people. If we didn't exist in cities and if pest control didn't exist in cities, you know, people would be overrun with rodents and then all kinds of diseases would be transmitted by rodents, including, you know, ticks that transmit, you know, Lyme disease. If it's not controlled, you know, you've got viruses, respiratory illnesses. If we didn't take care of roach problems, you would have asthma, allergies, and 95 other diseases transmitted by roaches. We're not the ones doing this. This is not us. Here, here is, here is the, the, where the Centers for Disease Control has poison control center data. You can see it right here. I gotta. I should make these a little bigger, um, so you guys can see this. Yeah, let me make it a little bigger. Yeah, here we go. All right, uh, maybe a little bigger than that. All right, so here's poison control center data, access to this, and this is the report that was published, the annual report. The, 20, the 2018 Annual Report of American Association of Poison Control Centers National Poison Data System, NPDS, 36th Annual Report. You can buy this report, but I'll give you a small synopsis of it right here. Here is a synopsis of this, of the top chemicals that are in homes that are reported to poison control. Two million responded. Two million right here exposure cases a year where people were exposed to something the exposure every 15 seconds in the united states along the 50 states what are the highest risk it's not pesticides it's non-prescription and prescription pain relievers that people are calling in about where they've done it. Look at the over here on this side where the average age, 44% of these cases are children under five years old. The next is cleaning substances, cosmetic products, sedative and antipsychotic drugs or antipsychotic drugs and antidepressants. All cases were single dose substance exposures where a child got a hold of one of these and was either poisoned or exposed to it. it, it an exposure, remember, is not poisoning. It's not toxicity, but they accidentally drank the pill. They accidentally took it. They accidentally got it in their mouth. 13% of all exposures Okay, we're suicide. When you look at the pesticide death in the U.S., which is 40 to 60, 88% of those people took a pesticide to kill themselves. That's the data. 92% 92 92 of these cases, look over here. Oh, my bad. 92% of the cases occurred in residences. 66% of these cases were managed at home where they weren't taken to, to a doctor because that's the poison control center can tell you what to do if a child is poisoned. I'll have links to all this so that you guys can have it, anybody can have it and verify the data. 
See, the most dangerous part about handling pesticides is that you have children have access to it. Children should not have access to any chemical, any substance. Anything should be out of their reach. This is why I'm taking the time to do this. Because it does not matter if it was a pesticide or an aspirin. The fact is that even if the child is safe, even if there is no long-term damage, we don't understand what that ramification is going to have in the future, how an organ can be damaged long-term. It isn't really understood. And this is why everyone needs to treat pesticides, chemicals, oil, gasoline. It doesn't matter as a dangerous substance and keep it out of reach of children. This is why it says caution and warning, keep out of reach of children. Because we know that this is what happens. Here is the poison data from 2012. I said, let me look back. The data is identical. Nothing has changed. Here is the sad part. Guys, this is where I have where I lose it. We live in the age of Google where the information is available, yet ignorance abounds in the age of information. You have everything that you need, yet you won't go look for it. You won't read the label. You won't read the information. It says read before applying. And you won't read it. You just simply apply it. You store it anywhere, thinking this stuff is sold over the counter. It has to be safe. There is nothing that is safe. Nothing can be classified as safe. Look at this. Here is the, mor the, the morbidity and mortality weekly report. Um, and the CDC publishes this. And look at the background. I'm going to put it a little bigger. I'm see if it can get a little bigger there. And even if it's going to block me, it's okay. I'll, I'll block the text. Here is the reality of where they track death from pesticides. But it gives you a great background. A pesticide is a substance or mixture intended for preventing, destroying, repelling, or mitigating pests such as insects, mice, and small animals, weeds, and fungi. Let me go down here so that you can see the text. It says, types of pesticides include insecticides, herbicides, fungicides. The United States plant or insect growth regulators, defoliants, uh, and desiccants, also referred to as pesticides. So anything that basically kills something is a pesticide, including uh, disinfectants, okay? Now, in 2007, right here, let me, let me highlight this for you so that you can see and be patient with me, right here. In 2007, approximately 5.1 billion pounds of pesticide were used in the United States. 5.1 billion pounds. That includes herbicides for weed control, everything. Okay? 17%, 887 uh, million pounds were conventional pesticides. These are not like RUP, restricted use pesticide. We're talking about conventional pesticides. Of the conventional pesticides in the United States, approximately 61% were herbicides, the glyphosates. 15% were fumigants. 11% were insecticides. 9% were fungicides and 3.9 were conventional other pesticides. Approximately 80% of conventional pesticides in the United States was used in agriculture. Remember I told you, we're not the ones applying all the pesticides. So when a pesticide gets targeted and it gets banned it is usually because it's been used in agriculture or it's overused in agriculture not because it's overused in the home here's the problem when it gets banned in agriculture even if it's a good pesticide that we can use to control people's pests efficiently 
We pay the price because we no longer have that tool available to us. And now we have to come to you and say, we got to use this brand new insecticide, which costs three times more because this old one was so overly used. That brings up the cost. Or it's just not available. And then we got to go retrain and train how to use a new pesticide as a professional. And we have to pass that along to the consumer. That's the reality. Listen. In the United States, 12% was non-agricultural, industrial, or commercial government. 8% was home and garden. Home and garden is 8%. 12% was non-agricultural, industrial, or commercial, or government. When you, when you start analyzing the pounds of insecticide that we use around a home, it's, it's around 1% now. Because remember, uh, rodenticides and everything is lumped in there. Not everybody's using all of this. Check this out. Pesticide use in agriculture, residential, and other settings. Uh, no, I don't want to read all that to you. All right. Here's, 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 here's the data. Let me go over here. During 20, 2013, 15,430 pesticide-related injuries were documented from 79,405 single-substance pesticide exposures. So 15,000 out of the 79,000 exposures were illnesses. Remember, this is mostly all these injuries are mostly in agriculture. Look, look at this. My, 13,000 minor health concerns, 22 deaths. 22 deaths in the United States from pesticides. Now, 22 deaths, get, understand, please. It's 22 too many. But when you look at who, how, they, how they died, 16. Look here, I'm highlighting it for you. 16 of the 22 deaths were found to either be intentional suicide or intentional misuse or abuse. In other words, they intentionally drank it to kill themselves. That leaves us with eight fatalities related to pesticide use. And we're not talking about, understand, chronic toxicity. I understand that is part of the problem later on, that if you're exposed and an and exposure and toxicity have to do with how many times you're exposed and what is the toxicity of that active ingredient to the exposure and how many times it has to happen over a lifetime in order to have toxicity or have chronic toxicity okay that is the measurement of how we we define this so understand that hey eight percent of all the pesticide is being used in homes and 12 percent and yet all of these uh, communities are banning pesticides when the major use is in agriculture, not in homes. You're, as a homeowner, understand by not being educated and not understanding the reality that you're being sold a bill of goods that you have nothing to do with because only 8% of homes are applying a, a pesticide. Uh, the, the amount of chemical being used of the pounds going in the ground, only 8% are going into homes. You see, that is the reality. So when a community wants to ban a pesticide, only 13% is being used in lawn. The other, the other 80% is in agriculture. And they're banning it in communities, making an example out of people that are not the problem. You're going to pay for this as a homeowner when you're overrun with pests and nobody can do anything about it because a rodenticide was banned. That's the reality. Now, you get this uh, association between, you know, pyrethroid exposure in the United States. Well, if, you were a, if 80% of people are doing their own pest control and only 20% are buying it and the majority of the pesticide used in residential home is over the counter, 
then people are poisoning themselves. That's the only thing you can deduce from these studies. That when you look at the numbers of three phenoxybenzonic acid in urine samples out of 216, uh, uh, 2,116 adults, oh, let me, I'm sorry, the cardiovascular risk of people over 14 years of observation. I'm going to give you a link to this. Look at the study. But it isn't us doing it because this is why I've opted for IPM. This is why I said there's no need to spray the inside of a home every single month. Yet 90% of customers that call me say, hey, I need you to come and spray my home. And if you're not going to do an indoor spray, you're only going to do an outdoor spray. I don't want you. Why? You're doing it to yourself. There's no need to spray anything in the home. Yeah, we might have to do it once to get rid of the problem. Once we get rid of the problem, we can prevent it from the outside with exclusion, with caulk, you know, with, with sealants, uh, with door sealants. And you might have to fix up your home and spend a couple of hundred dollars, but you no longer need the pesticide. See, this is what nobody wants to hear. The industry doesn't want to hear this. You don't want to hear this. But this is what the universities have been teaching. This is what I've been doing in my business. If it works in my business, it works in hundreds of other businesses. It works in hospitals. It works in, in, in high-level facilities. It works in lead buildings. But you're addicted to it has to be sprayed. And if it isn't sprayed, then you're not doing your job right. And this is why we have to bring out the education to show people that there are other ways. I'm going to give you an example of the most popular product. There is absolutely nothing wrong with this product. It is an over-the-counter product that will do what it says it does. Okay? This is the label for it. Here is an insecticide label, which is pretty close to what, as a professional pest control operator, a pest control technician and applicator, would have to follow, he would have to understand it, read it before he applies it because his license and his reputation demands on it. The product does what the product says it's going to do. It's made by an excellent company. As a matter of fact, it's, it has two active ingredients. Imiprothrin, imiprothrin, and cypermethrin. We use cypermethrin all the time. It's a commonly used insecticide, 10% and 6%. That is enough to kill anything on contact. You don't need a higher dose than that. You don't need to mix a more stronger product, whatever a stronger product is. That will do the job. Notice what it says. Let me bring this a little higher here. Kills on contact. That's what it's designed to do. It is not designed to control an infestation in a home. It is, I saw an American cockroach. I saw an ant trail going into my home and I sprayed the trail. It is not once you have an infestation of German roaches or American roaches in the structure, this product is not designed to solve that problem. It kills on contact. So does a shoe, by the way. So if you take soap and water and you spray it on an ant trail, you will kill every ant in that trail. You don't really need this product to do that. But if you want to stop screaming very quickly and stop that roach from running and flying, this is what it's intended to use. Over here, it has these little uh, asterisks, controls bugs. There's a little dash right there meaning what how much control notice here is a label and it says keep out of reach of children it's it's also in spanish caution why is that caution label there because it causes irritation is that that classification of how toxic that product is is based on the reaction based on an LD50 known as the lethal dose 50. And how, how much of that chemical does it take to fill, kill 50% of the target pest? 
So it causes eye irritation. Precaution, precaution, and it's even a C additional precautionary statement on the back. All right, so let's move it over here. And what I'm doing is giving you label training that nobody's going to give you in the world on my podcast because I want you to do things right. I don't want you to intoxicate your kids. All right, directions for use. Right over here. Number one, it kills bugs fast on contact and keeps on killing with residual action indoors even after you spray for up to four weeks. What you got to understand about that up to four weeks is what, what is sunlight doing to that product? Photo degradation. What is chemical degradation doing by you cleaning that surface? By you adding bleach to your kitchen? By you doing something else? For up to four weeks. Now, up to four weeks could be a week. It's up to. It's not. It will control for four weeks. This is the same thing we have to deal with on professional labels. Now, notice where it says direction for use. The first thing that's on there. It is a violation of federal law to use this product in a manner inconsistent with its labeling. Meaning. If the label and all these instructions and everything that is on there tells you, you have to do this and apply it this way, and you can't do this and apply it that way, then you violate federal law by not applying it. This is what the standard that as professionals we are held to. The problem that you're saying, is, well, who's going to know? And this is why we have so many exposures, so many poisonings, so many people with chronic problems because 80% of people are doing it and are doing it however they want to. Do you see our point? Do you see my point? So you need to read. It is intended in the label. It says it is intended for indoor use only, not outdoor use. You have to read this entire label. It says, do not use as a space spray. In other words, you can't, if you have flying insects in your house, you cannot use this as a space spray to kill flies in your home. Listen, this is a petroleum-based products. Do not, look at all the do nots in here. Look, these are all the do nots. Do not apply to human pets, plants, or contaminate feed or food stuff. Dishes and utensils, you can't just open up your cabinet and spray the inside of the cabinet because you saw roaches. You just contaminated all of your plates. You contaminated all of your utensils. You contaminated food and feed, your animal food, and you're eating it. This is what we see all the time. Cover and remove exposed food dishes, utensils, and food handling equipment. You must cover them. If you've got a blender, a toaster, you got to cover that toaster. During any application to sealing on structure, cover surfaces below with plastic sheathing or similar materials. Do not apply this product in a way that will contact any person or pet. You can't apply it on your counters just freely. You can't just apply it to the floor and let your dog walk all over it. You're thinking that this is safe because it's over the counter. It can't be that strong. It's exactly the same strength that we would use it at. This is what nobody tells you. Do not use water-based sprays in conduits, motor housing, junction boxes, switch boxes, or electrical equipment because of possible shock hazard. During any indoor surface application, do not allow dripping or runoff to occur. Do not use as a space spray. Do Use in well-ventilated areas. Do not use in greenhouses or plants grown for food. Spray until wet in cracks around baseboards in cracks 
not the entire baseboard. Listen, when bugs are driven out, spray directly. In other words, the bug, you spray a little crack in a crevice, the roach comes out, spray that roach there, not the entire baseboard. Apply to entrails along doors, windows, whatever ants enter the house. Store and disposal. You can't just dump this fool into the garbage. You have to apply it, empty it out, then you do it. it avoid contact with skin or clothing. Watch thoroughly with soap, water, after handling, before eating, drinking, chewing gum, using tobacco, or using the toilet. Do you realize that you have 100% absorption in the genital areas? So people that are getting, you know, all these diseases and all these problems because they're handling products like they're inert, like they don't have consequences. And they're wondering why they have all these chronic diseases and it's because they violated the label. This is what you have to know. First aid. Here is what you have to do if it gets on you. Okay? This is all part of the label. This is all part of what you need to be doing to keep your family safe, to use products safely so that your, your kids don't drink the product, your kids don't come in contact with the product, your pets. I mean, I, every time I get a call and I hear the person, are your products safe? And they ask us if our products are safe. And then I go in there and there's five pesticides, there's dust everywhere, there's pills everywhere of, the, of you know, roach tablets, there are stations everywhere, and they've applied all this like it has no consequences. When you read the label, it has the same restrictions as ours. If I would do what most people do in a home, I would end up in jail. This is what I'm trying to do. This is why I'm taking the time to do this. We have to educate people. This is a great product, but if you have an infestation of German roaches in your kitchen, this is never going to solve it. That's not what it's intended to do. Understand that. Then you need to change something, but stop spraying this all over your house everywhere like it doesn't have any consequences, like it doesn't have any effect on you. And this is what I wanted to do. Um, look, here, here is a product that we use. This is Taustar. This is probably the most used insecticide that's available. And it has the same warning. Keep out of reach of children. Precautionary statement. Disposal statement. We Look, it tells us here what we have to use as, as pest control professionals. Our, our recommended safety. Wash hands before eating. Remove clothing. Violation. Look, it is a federal... It is a violation of federal law to use this product in a manner inconsistent with its label. Do not apply blockade to interior surfaces of homes. I mean, it has the same restrictions. Professional products and over-the-counter products aren't better. They just come concentrated so that we can make a diluted amount because it's a lower cost to ship a concentrate than it is to ship a gallon of, of, of water. It doesn't make it any safer. It doesn't make it harder. It doesn't make it um, more to use. We all have the same restrictions. So I hope that this podcast has been educational for you, that has instructed you. If it has, do me a favor, give it a thumbs up, like it, share it with your friends, subscribe, listen to the Pest Geek podcast where we give out information that is very valuable. Um, and just, I hope to see you next time, folks. You have a pistacular day.